My name is Lexi Signor. I'm a musician and I teach at Indiana State University. I'm here to share my story with you today. I've done a lot of really exciting things and at the highest levels and it's been a heck of a journey. And I think if I'm able to share my story with you today, it might just inspire you to go after your own story. Mine starts in Northern Michigan at my family's home. I come from a family of musicians. My mom played guitar and sang, and my dad played piano and saxophone and trombone. He was a multi-instrumentalist. And he was sort of known in the neighborhood as being particularly brilliant. He was the kid in school that would sit you know, in his study hall and just like scribble Mozart sonatas on his desk when he was really bored. Um, I also realized at a really young age that I also have a photographic memory. I see everything in pictures perfectly. Uh, that's not to say it's completely eidetic. I'm not one of those people that can tell you what, you know, what the date or what Tuesday was, you know, October 12th, 1989. Uh, I'm not one of those people. But uh, I, I realized at a young age that I had some superpowers, and I just kind of thought everybody had superpowers. Kind of the way growing up in a musical family you kind of just figured that everyone plays an instrument. So when it came time for me to choose an instrument at my band program at my middle school, I went for the smallest one with the least amount of buttons. I know, it's shocking. It, there was no philosophy, I was 10. And so I picked up the trumpet and I was like, yeah, this is my instrument, this is awesome. So to say that I was a natural at trumpet is a bit of an understatement. I took to trumpet like a duck takes to water. There was nothing I couldn't do on the trumpet from a really young age. So I ascended the ranks in my middle school band and my high school band and my honors bands. I was being sent to this camp and that camp. I eventually went to the Interlock and Arts Academy and fought my way through the ranks there. Seventh chair, fourth chair, third chair, finally first chair. And all along the way, I was thinking to myself, man, there are just not a lot of female trumpet players around. What's up with that? That's weird. Um, and I didn't really pay it much mind until I, I got into high school and it became more competitive. And I started to hear things like, oh, oh, she's it's a girl. I wonder if she's any good. Or, wow, you play like a guy. You sound so great. Wow, that's amazing. And I always just thought, that is so strange. Why are they saying those things? That's odd. So I continued on with my studies in spite of this. I pursued a degree in music education from Northern Michigan University. And I finished a five-year program in four years. I was tenacious. I love music education. I believe in education. And so it was very easy for me to get through that program and just rock it out and, and get my first job. Oh my goodness, right out of college. It was amazing. Got my first job. And I thought to myself, now's my opportunity to pay this forward. Now this is the opportunity for me to share this love of music with others. And so I grew in the span of three years, a program from about 50 kids to over 700, which included a music program K4. We were very proud of ourselves. And then the recession in 2008 hit and there just wasn't a budget for band anymore. And so I went on after that and um, I went on to different things. I, I pursued a couple master's degrees and in amongst doing so, I of course stayed in touch with my band friends, my band parents while I was doing those degrees. And um, we got to talking one, one time and uh, this band parent who had become the president of the board said to me, you know, it's a real shame that they let you go. I said, yeah, I loved that job. I would have retired from that job. And he said, yeah, it's, um, well, they didn't let you go because they didn't have the money. And I said, excuse me? Like, it was a budget issue. We had like 300 people testify on behalf of the band and they still cut it. And he said, no, no. It wasn't, it wasn't that you weren't doing a good job. It was that you're too good. And I said, I'm too good? How does that even work? Isn't that the goal here? You know, that's what they tell you in school. Like, go do the best you can do at your thing. And so I went and did the best I can do at my thing. Is that not what they wanted? And he said, well, you kind of rubbed people the wrong way. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, people leaving at halftime at the basketball games or football games and, you know, the growth of the band, the attention of the band. There were some people that got a little jealous and they found a way to get you out of the picture. And I got angry 
But I didn't let, let it stop me. I said, okay, so those are the rules. It's not necessarily go out and do the best you can. It's, it's do as much as you can without rocking the boat and making people feel a certain way. <laughs> okay, so I went on and I did two master's degrees in spite of this. I thought, okay, well, I guess I'll take that loss and I'm just gonna persevere. So I went on and I did two master's degrees at the University of Missouri, one in classical trumpet performance and one in jazz performance and pedagogy. I won several awards, won several competitions. I was, you know, one of the best trumpet players in that area for a while. And uh, I eventually went on and got into IU and I started my doctoral work. And all the while I was, I was gigging. I was uh, working to make ends meet and, and make sure that my bills stayed paid. And here in the Midwest, everybody kind of knows everybody. So when people would say, uh, oh yeah, I need a trumpet player for something. And somebody would go, oh yeah, call Lexi, she's available. I was on the gig and I had a blast. I got to play with some of the best musicians uh, anywhere, uh, many of whom are right here in Indianapolis. And so I was gigging and I was a lot of, having a lot of success. And before I knew it, I was, I was on the road with the Diva Jazz Orchestra and it brought me out to Philadelphia and it was so exciting. I was, I was staying in Philadelphia with the show. I was finishing my coursework at the same time. I was out there just really, you know, kind of musically tearing it up. And we're sort of taught in the music business, in order to keep getting gigs, all you gotta do is show up early, play great, and be helpful. It's not always in those words, but that's basically it. And so that's what I did. And I was like continually having success. So I thought, all right, the system works, nice. So I, I thought, okay, well, the East Coast is cool. Maybe I'll move out here. And my partner, and I moved out to the East Coast, and he had been based on the East Coast, and he tried to work, network me into some gigs, which is what you do. And he would refer me for gigs, and instead of me automatically being put on the gig as I had been in the Midwest, he had to summarize my entire resume to get these contractors to put me on a wedding band. I mean, it's not like I was playing on Air Force One, okay? We're talking weddings. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, this is so messed up. This is not what they taught us. This is not how the, the rules work. I don't understand. And um, so I finished my, my coursework and, and uh, I was gigging where I could, when I could on the East Coast. I had a lot of work, but it was hard to get. And so I thought, okay, all right, I've done that. And I got the opportunity to either go on the road with the first Broadway tour of Escape to Margaritaville or take a teaching job here at Indiana State University. And I thought, here we go, this is, this is the time. I win, I got the degrees, I'm gonna go get this job, it's gonna be awesome. I can go out and inspire others to pursue their passion in music and it's gonna be exciting and amazing and I just wanna do good things. So I got the job and they essentially said, okay, here are the things you'll teach. Do this to the best of your ability. Now, I had been burned once on the whole do it to the best of your ability thing. So I was like, no, 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 I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna teach well, and I'm not gonna rock the boat. I'm not gonna try to be crazy, awesome, off the charts, amazing. I'm just gonna do the job. And in my opinion, <laughs> I do the job thoroughly, but I seek to also do the job as effectively as possible. And that to me means bringing in guest artists and networking and making sure that my students have the best possible information that they have, uh, that I have available to give them and, and networking them in with other resources and just generally doing as much good as possible. And so by the end of my first semester, after having given a really great concert with the jazz ensemble, I was thinking, woo, we got this, we win. Awesome, everybody, you know, happily ever after kind of thing. And then I got my first review from the personnel committee and I was told things like, you need to tone it down. You need to behave more in keeping with collegiate decorum. And several other things that had very little to do with my teaching at all. And I, and I was shocked and I was angry and I thought to myself, wait, wait, wait. This is not what, this is not what the rules say. The rules, you said just do, you know, teach the things as well as you can to the best of your ability. And that's what I did. Is that not good enough? And as soon as I asked myself that question, I went, oh, no, 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 it happened again. It's not that I'm not good enough. It's that I'm too good. Now, granted, I guess that's probably kind of, kind of a good thing, being too good at your job. But I was so good that I was making people uncomfortable 
so uncomfortable that they were feeling a need to be passive aggressive and punish me for this goodness. <laughs> and so instead of letting that just take the wind out of my sails, I asked for some letters of recommendation. I got together a 16 page rebuttal and I, I followed the protocol that I needed to stand up to these people and say, no, I'm doing a good job. These are the reasons I'm doing a good job. These are the pedagogical reasons I do these things. And these are all the degrees and the people who agree with me that say I should be doing these things. So I intend to keep doing those things. And thankfully, because there are a few good men, men among us, they saw reason and they let me continue teaching. And it was then that I realized that the rules that they teach us, our teachers with the best of intentions, aren't actually the rules. And so we have to learn these unspoken rules. So nearing the end of January, going into the pandemic, I was sort of left in an inter introspective state, as many people were, are. Depends on how you look at it, I suppose. And I started getting counseling because after that committee review, I was not well mentally and I, I sought help and I just needed to get my mind right to do this job and to do it to the best of my abilities. And in this counseling, we summarized, you know, some of what I just told you about, you know, having been particularly brilliant as a child and understanding rules and living by these parameters that I perceived around me. And my therapist said, well, have you ever been tested for autism? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm not one of those people, no. And uh, she said, no, you actually might have autism. Would you like to pursue that? And I, and I thought to myself, well, if it helps me be a better person and a better teacher and, and understand myself more, sure. So over the course of the next few months, I became diagnosed with uh, Asperger's syndrome, which is no longer a thing. It's now just autism spectrum disorder. But looking back on my, my experiences, I just went, oh my goodness, this is why. This is why I keep messing up. This is why I keep being told I'm too good. It's because I can't read the signals of people being jealous. I can't read the signals of people being uncomfortable. I just don't have that ability. Yet, in spite of this, I still managed to succeed in several different realms to a, a national level in some cases. I've played with Adele, I've played with Keith Urban. I have been a clinician from Florida to Michigan and across this country. I've recorded with some of the biggest names in music. I have taught thousands of students and all in the face of this looming misogyny. It can be done. <laughs> we can do these things. We can do whatever we put our minds to. We women, we people with disabilities. I don't, I don't really think autism is a disability. I, I think it's superpowers. I look back at finishing two master's degrees in three years and I go, oh, other people don't do that? And my friends go, no, they don't. <laughs> You're kind of a freak. I have a photographic memory. I just thought everybody had superpowers. And they go, no, we can't do that. I can compose an entire big band chart in eight hours. I can arrange a big band chart in four hours. I see music notation in my head when I hear music. It's maddening. Listening to the radio is really tough. Um, but all of these things I just thought were normal for everyone are actually superpowers. So in spite of all of these hurdles, I've still managed to succeed. And I'm here today to share that with you in hopes that you will also succeed, that your goals are not governed by these obstacles, whatever they are. You can overcome them and be the very best version of you. I'm working on being that best version, and I think I'm doing a pretty darn good job. You can ask my students. But I'm here to speak on behalf of those who don't have a voice or don't feel like they can. Be you. Be the vibrant, awesome, superpower driven version of you. And the more you can do that, the happier you're going to be and the more effective you're going to be in whatever field you choose. Thank you. <laughs>